So before uh, Harry's uh, appointment at uh, UC Davis, uh, he spent about 27 years at the University of Illinois at the Irmine uh, Champaign, Irmine Champaign. Uh, that's another university where we have a lot of alumni in Taiwan. Uh, <coughs> I have two former vice president, uh, and, and they, they influence a lot, and <laughs> they, they bring a lot of spirit from UC, uh, I'm sorry, University of Illinois. Uh, and our, one of our former president, <coughs> as I mentioned, was a student of Roger Adams. A student of Roger Adams. Uh, so, uh, and <coughs> And when he was at the University of Illinois, he uh, was a, a director of the uh, University of Illinois Biotech Center, and founding director of the WM Keck uh, Center for Comparative and Functional Genomics, and founding director of the Institute for uh, Genomic Bi uh, Biology. And as you know, Harry's uh, uh, research was well recognized for uh, the area of mammalian uh, genome evolution or chromosome rearrangement, that, that kind of things. <coughs> and he and his team <coughs> have studied how mammalian genomes evolve and the role of uh, chromosome rearrangement in adaptation, uh, speciation, and the uh, origins of cancer. And as I mentioned before, um, he is well recognized for his work and, and, and received many honors and award. He's a foreign member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Agriculture and Forestry, and he's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Science. And in 2011, he was awarded the World Prize in Agriculture. So in his lecture, he will discuss uh, the recently developed uh, reference assisted chromosome assembly algorithm, which is a powerful approach for predicting chromosome uh, organization from next generation uh, sequencing. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome uh, Harris. Okay, as um, President Wong mentioned, uh, my topic today is mammalian chromosome evolution. And uh, to begin, let me just say a few things about chromosomes to bring you back to biology 101. Um, chromosomes are generally considered to have three primary functions, right? They have to replicate themselves for normal cell division. They need to recombine to generate novel genetic variants on which natural selection can act. And they need to undergo transcription into RNA, which then encodes the entire uh, proteome as well as regulatory RNAs that are involved in all different types of cell functions. As a result of the last uh, 10 or 15 years of work in, in my lab and work in other labs, it's very clear that chromosomes have another important function, and that is rearrangement. And so chromosomes rearrange during evolution. They shuffle their organization, and as such, again, create variation on which novel, uh, in which natural selection may act, and are also intimately involved in speciation and adaptation. And so chromosomes are a hallmark feature of what it is that defines a given species, right? And so the hallmark then of, of, of speciation is that many all species have a characteristic number of, of chromosomes. And in the mammals, chromosome numbers may vary by, whoops, that was the wrong one. I knew I'd do that. Sorry. Okay. Chromosome numbers vary by a factor of more than 10 to 15, although the entire DNA content is approximately the same. And so, uh, for example, in the Indian munchak have a very unusual karyotype where the male, females can have uh, six chromosomes because they have a fused sex chromosome with their autosome three, and males can have seven chromosomes to this uh, feller here, which is the viscacha rat found in Argentina, which has 102 
chromosomes as its normal diploid karyotype. As I said, the, that's a huge variation in chromosome number, but DNA content is approximately the same on the order of three billion bases. So it's very clear that um, chromosomes represent a higher order of gene organization, but very little is actually known about how chromosome numbers evolve, what the evolutionary forces are that drive the numbers of chromosomes, and how the genes are organized on the chromosomes themselves. And so we've been interested in these two very fundamental basic questions. And those are, what are the mechanisms by which chromosomes evolve? And what are the, is the evolutionary and biological significance of the chromosome rearrangements? And really what we would like to do is explain this slide, which took about 100 million years to produce, okay? And these are both mammals, elephants and mice are placental mammals. But there's a tremendous difference in phenotype, in size, uh, and what we'd like to know is what the contribution of chromosome rearrangements is to the enormous degree of phenotypic diversity that we observe among the 23 or so mammal orders of mammals. And so this field uh, began, oh, maybe 20 years ago to, to, to take off with a technique called chromosome painting. And chromosome painting was a sort of a crude method, but it was actually quite effective at demonstrating a very important fundamental principle in comparative genomics and that is large blocks of chromosomes in the tens of millions of bases. If you compare two genomes, you'd find that large blocks of those chromosomes are conserved. And that was done by a relatively primitive method of labeling up the DNA or the libraries of individual chromosomes from one species and hybridizing those probes using fluorescent markers to the metaphase of another species. And this uh, diagram here shows uh, the human on aardvark chromosome paint. And as you can see from the color scheme, there are huge blocks of the aardvark chromosomes that correspond to human chromosomes. So the aardvarks have just nine autosomes, and this figure shows that the entire uh, uh, composition of human chromosome three is found on the aardvark chromosome two. And that's just by painting. Now, that's a great method if you want to do painting and pairwise painting between all many, many different mammalian species, and that was done. The problem is, is that this is an extremely low resolution method. If you really want to understand what the genes are within the blocks and what's happening at the evolutionary breakpoint regions, you need to go to much higher resolution. You need to have maps for different species, and you need to have sequence. And so things really began to change around the dawn of the millennium. And um, these changes were brought about by the development of high resolution linkage and physical maps. And I just put this one up there as an example. Chi Wei mentioned that I was involved in agricultural research. This is just an example of the kinds of work that we did over a period of uh, 15 years or so with cattle maps. If you look at the first maps, linkage maps that we developed back in 1996, about 186 markers across the genome, you know, very, very low resolution. This is the same chromosome. If you look at the same chromosome and the maps developed once we went to radiation hybrid mapping in 2000, and then to more detailed high resolution radiation hybrid mapping, and finally when we added in back end sequencing in 2005, you know, you go from 186 markers to, uh, to, um, to more than 3,000 markers in a very short period of time. And these very high resolution maps allow you to do comparative genomics at much higher resolution as well. And so some of that work, again, um, came out from our lab. The first really three-way comparisons up until 2000, the only species that you had to compare were really with the human and the mouse. But the cow, because of the, the work that uh, we and others had done on developing these high resolution maps, allowed us to begin to compare chromosome organization, comparative chromosome chromosome organization um, uh, between uh, uh, more than two <laughs> mammalian species. If you're going to do comparison, 
you know, a third is, is extremely, extremely important. And so this work quickly evolved as DNA sequence became available for the human and mouse genomes. And what our group did in collaboration with uh, Steve O'Brien's group at NCI, that was Bill Murphy was there at the time, uh, my former postdoc Dennis Larkin and graduate students Annalee Edwards Vanderwind, is we developed methodologies and data visualization approaches and bioinformatics tools to begin to combine the data from DNA sequences and DNA maps and to be able to compare genomes to one another at, at, at very high resolution. And this is just an example of what the visualization looked like. And uh, since these data are almost 10 years old now, I'll just quickly summarize some of the things that we learned from these initial, um, uh, initial comparisons where we used the human genome as a reference or the mouse genome as a reference. Those were the only two sequence genomes at that time. Up until about 2005, it was widely believed that chromosome breakage during evolution, how you reshuffled all of those segments, was random. And what we showed by these multi-species, first multi-species genome comparisons in the science paper was eight mammalian genomes that up to 20 percent of those evolutionary breakpoint regions could be ever, uh, reused in evolution in independent lineages. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about that. We also showed that the rates of rearrangements would, could differ in the different ma mammalian lineages and very uh, interesting observation at the time where the mammalian radiation really exploded about 30, 60 million years ago coincided with the time of the great uh, meteor impact, which is the time of the Cretaceous, uh, which is called the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. So a great period of expansion in the numbers of species and their adaptations occurred at a time where genome evolution, chromosome evolution was shown to be uh, rapidly increasing by these studies. By looking at the breakpoint regions and the conserved blocks, we were able to determine that there was a much higher density. I believed that when we looked in the evolutionary breakpoint regions that these would be dead regions. These would be regions where you know, there were no genes. These would be gene deserts because if you started to break in regions where there are lots of genes, right, it wouldn't be very good <laughs> in an evolutionary sense. Well, of course, that was a completely wrong. Uh, we proved that hypothesis wrong. In fact, it was exactly the opposite. There was h significantly higher gene uh, density and greater numbers of segmental duplications with the evolutionary breakpoint regions, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We also looked at centromere and telomere evolution. Centromere positions tended to be much more dynamic, where telomere positions tended to be more conserved. And then a very interesting observation is that the um, evolutionary breakpoint regions had a high frequency of co-occurrence with breakpoints that were found in certain cancers. And this is an area that as we now pick up activity in my lab, we're going to be looking much more closely at the relationship between evolutionary uh, breakpoints and cancer breakpoints. And, uh, and uh, this is obviously an area that can lead to some very interesting ideas about uh, diagnosis and, and treatment of certain types of cancers. So after the eight species uh, experiment, we went on because uh, now the chimp genome became available, macaque genome, the dog genome, other genomes were sequenced, and, and that uh, permitted much higher resolution comparisons. In addition, an outgroup here, uh, the, apo the uh, opossum, also became available. And basically, what we were able to do then is look at the entire phylogenetic distribution of mammals, and we now had a reasonable uh, uh, representation of uh, four mammalian orders. So we had three from the primate order. Uh, we had two rodents, the rat and the mouse. We had one from carnivora, the dog, and we had two set artiodactyls. That's the group that includes uh, the whales and all the even-toed ungulate mammals. And uh, that was the, the cow genome, the one that we had been working on for many years as well as the newly, uh, a very new high resolution map for the pig. And so what that allows us to do is to go back very far actually in the, hist in the evolutionary history of mammals. And when we look at the common ancestor of these mammals existed about 200 million years ago for the opossum, which is down here among the marsupials, and 
those that exist in this placental group, the Eutherian group. And so we could reconstruct the genomic changes that have occurred over this very, uh, very uh, relatively actually short evolutionary period of time, but producing this enormous uh, array of more than 5,400 extant mammalian species that exist today. And we used the chicken as an outgroup. And that was a, a very important one because that allowed us to go from the placental, uh, or rather from the, uh, from, from the mammalian group, which marsupials are non-placental mammals, all the way back to amniotes. That's our common vertebrate ancestor, which existed with a chicken about 325 million years ago. So we actually can compare chromosome evolution, look at, at chromosome evolution over a period of 325 million years. And that revealed some very uh, interesting findings. First, you can ask the question of, you know, oh, first let me explain what this, these, these pictures are, okay? So you have to adapt your eyes to these. So this is an outline. This is actually represents the Q arm, the long arm of human chromosome one. It's about a 70 million base fragment. And laid over the 70 million base fragment of human chromosome one, are these conserved syntonies, syntony meaning genes on the same chromosome. These are the homologous syntony blocks from these different species overlaid on to the background of the human reference genome. So if you look at this uh, figure here, if we look at the chimp, we can see that human chromosome, this part of human chromosome one and chimp chromosome one, as it is named, are completely syntenic. There are no disruptions in the gene order of chimp chromosome one and human chromosome one, but as we look at other species that are more phylo phylogenetically distant from the chimp, you can see numerous different kinds of rearrangements. Now the resolution of these rearrangements you can't really tell. Some of these involve translocations when you see chromosomes of different number. Some involve inversions, some involve duplications, some involve fusions, and some involve fissions. These are all of the, the types of, of, of rearrangements, chromosome rearrangements that one would see during evolution. But you can see, in this case, the more closely, species more closely related to humans had a more common syntenic relationship to those that were more phylogenetically distant. However, in all of these pairwise comparisons, we can add up all of these homologous synteny blocks. And if we look across all of mammals, not just the eutherian mammals, but the placentals plus the opossum, the didelphomorphia, the marsupials, we can count about 1,800 homologous synteny blocks that had an average size of 4.6 million bases. That's about 50 to 60 genes. So this tells us that through approximately 200 million years of evolution that these mammalian genomes are made up of blocks of about 50 or 60 genes that have rearranged themselves uh, over, over time. But within these blocks, as we show here, here is a block, for example, that we would label a multi-species homologous synteny block. Here is a block of about 5 million bases that we can see that is conserved all the way from the opossum all the way through to cattle and human genomes. Uninterrupted syntony of about 50 or 60 bases. So these blocks then, we could say, represent the building blocks of all chromosomes. And there are certain blocks that we see that are uninterrupted over very, very long evolutionary time periods. And so we wanted to know something more about these blocks. So if we look at the distribution, we see a very nice exponential distribution that one would expect from a random distribution of chromosome breakage. However, there were several blocks, at least six, if you go out here to 16 megabases, and even three that were above uh, 18 uh, or 20 million bases. And uh, the probability of having blocks this large uh, just by chance is, is, is well below uh, 5%. So you say, what is it about these multi-species homologous synteny blocks? Why are you getting such large blocks of hundreds, if not thousands of genes conserved over such evolution, long evolutionary time periods? 
And here's an example of this. Here's human chromosome 13. The multi-species homologous synteny blocks are shaded here. And here's one that's about 20 million bases that's conserved all the way back to chicken. It has uninterrupted synteny for 325 million years. You say, wow, that's, that's quite amazing. Why is that? What is inside those blocks? And so we asked that question by looking at all the homologous synte uh, multi-species homologous synteny blocks of greater than 3 million bases, of which there were 194 involving 3,166 genes. And as you can see, if you look over here, I hope you can see this in the back, this is done with the Metacore uh, uh, analysis program that looks at gene annotations in the human genome. If you look at what's in these blocks, and those of you who have done these experiments, this is an amazing result in that within the blocks you see genes that are related to very core developmental processes of the central nervous system and of basic body plan. And to go further, if you look at the networks within those blocks, you'd find many genes that are commonly regulated. So this one block on HSA2 uh, contains all of the Hox genes, but it also contains 50 genes annotated, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, approximately 50 genes that are regulated by, co-regulated by, by CMYK. And so, to summarize this, we'll say the following. The gene function in the community, genes function in communities, basically, these blocks that are arranged in ancient configurations that have been unbroken over long periods of time. The gene content in the blocks, when we look at them, they tend to be involved in very key and core developmental processes, development of the central nervous system, development of anatomical systems. They, um, that implies that those genes in those blocks are, have uh, a coordinate regulation of their gene expression and that they are absolutely critical to mammalian and in the case when we had it going all the way back to chicken to amniote development. And then the breakage within these blocks, the reason we don't see the breakage is because if you break the coordinate regulation of these genes, you're going to disrupt the normal developmental pathways. So this is a hypothesis, but it's very well supported by the data. You're going to have reduced fitness. So it says that in, in the meiotic process you can have breakage, but that these breakage are, is, uh, breakages within these blocks is associated with reduced fitness. So you never see an, organ, an individual or an organism that has any recombination within these blocks. And that's a, really, a rather remarkable finding that's been uh, confirmed uh, by many others uh, since 2009, since this was published. Now, those are the blocks. Those are the conserved blocks. But what about the regions between the blocks? What about the breakpoint regions? And those are shown here. So we can classify them by overlaying these homologous synteny blocks. So if you see a breakpoint, if you will, in a, single in a single species, we call those lineage specific evolutionary breakpoint regions. You don't see a breakpoint in any other species. If you see them in multiple members of the same order, here is a breakpoint that's present in a rat and a mouse, that's the same order. Those are the rodentia. So that's an ordinal breakpoint. And if you see a breakpoint that occurs in two independent lineages, here's one in a marsupial and here's one in a dog in the same spot, that's a reuse breakpoint. And you can tally that up across the entire genome and then with these gene annotation tools you can go in and say, well, what's in these blocks? The, what we, the reason that these are clear and we can identify them as breakpoint regions is we know that an inversion or a translocation has occurred, but that there's no sequence similar, there's no synteny within that region when we compare across the two genomes, be, between two or more genomes. So it is, uh, has genes, but there's no uh, obvious uh, relationship or similarity to other genes in the comparison. So when we looked in the breakpoint regions, we looked at 15 different functions, 15 different functional categories that are available from the uh, UCSC genome browser. And uh, I think this was uh, really a, uh, also a very surprising and uh, important result 
If you look within the breakpoint regions versus the homologous synteny blocks, you see significantly higher density of genes that have been segmentally duplicated and copy number variants. You see more genes, exon FE. You see more zinc finger genes. Those are the genes that are involved, of course, in, in transcriptional. <laughs> I thought it was a truthful statement. I, nobody, it was, it's just significantly different. If you say something, I guess you get zapped. That's not true. But this is true. These are significantly different and uh, involved in transcriptional regulation. And what this tells us uh, is that these evolutionary breakpoint regions where there's lack of synteny between genomes are cauldrons of genetic and genomic, genomic change. They are cauldrons. Uh, hot spots for genome evolution. You have tremendous expansions in number, copy number, segmental duplications, structural variants, SNPs, all kinds of interesting uh, genetic phenomena that are occurring in these breakpoint regions versus other regions of the genome. They're also significantly, you know, more than tenfold higher in their retrotransposon composition. And, uh, of course, uh, m all of you know that retrotransposons are major agents of evolutionary change. When they, when they insert themselves, they can change the way the gene expression is regulated. They can act as insertional mutagens. They do all kinds of things, but they also can be templates for non-allelic homologous recombination, non-homologous end joining. These are genetic mechanisms of the way chromosomes actually rearrange themselves. And so finding retrotransposons gave us a very important clue as to why these regions rearrange, is because they can serve as templates for, you know, for, for rearrangement. And in fact, this, just this week a paper came out. If you, have you seen the Gibbon paper? There's a paper on sequencing of the Gibbon ape genome. The Gibbon is unique among the primates in that it has the most highly rearranged genome related to other primates. And the authors of this paper associated with those rearrangements with a novel repeat element that occurs in those breakpoint regions called the lava repeat. So there's just lots of evidence now that this is, these retrotransposons are destabilizing chromosomes, promoting rearrangements by non-allelic non homologous recombination. And then uh, as a result of those rearrangements and the double-stranded breakage repair, you get, you lead to copy number variants and other, other kinds of uh, variants within and between genes. And so here's a, a nice example of that in a very visual way. So this is the Evolution Highway uh, uh, chrom comparative chromosome browser that we developed at the University of Illinois in conjunction with the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. And what we have here is a track that shows the density, that's the sequence feature is the density in, in bases for every 10,000 bases of DNA of that particular sequence feature. In this case, is segmental duplications. And what you see in the little red arrows are where the primate-specific breakpoints are. And if you line them up, uh, you know, in a very visual way, you can easily see that segmental duplications are lining up exactly where these um, where these evolutionary breakpoint regions are. So this particular chromosome, human chromosome 17, has, large, it's the, has the largest number of primate evolutionary break, of, uh, of breakpoints of any other human chromosome. Very active chromosome, whereas human chromosome 13 has very few rearrangements, but still those areas where rearrangements occur also are very much <laughs> with the truth, very much associated with evolutionary, uh, with um, segmental duplications. And of course, these segmental duplications, if you follow the work of Evan Eichler, these are may believed to be major drivers of adaptive evolution in mammals. Okay, now it's not just the human breakpoint. Say, okay, you just had one, bre one reference species. What about other species? Well, when we sequenced the cattle genome and we looked in the evolutionary breakpoints of the cattle genome, we found the same thing. We found this for every genome that we've actually looked at. In cattle, if you compare evolutionary breakpoint regions, the cattle-specific ones, as well as the, the more ordinal uh, specific breakpoints, more than 30, uh, approximately 34 percent of them, 34 um, percent uh, have 
uh, very large segmental duplications, which is also can be visualized here in the same way that we visualize them when we use the human genome reference. This is using the cattle genome of, as a reference. So this is, very, uh, this is very well confirmed now in a number of genomes. And they say, well, okay, what are those segmental duplications? What do they have to do with adaptive evolution? Okay, so the chromosomes are breaking, they're rearranging, they're duplicating and expanding. What kind of genes are in there? And here's a very nice example uh, of a, a gene that's very highly associated with an adaptive response. It's the beta defense in gene cluster. These are, um, are, are very highly charged uh, antibacterial uh, proteins. This one is located on cattle chromosome 27 at this cattle, basically this cattle specific um, breakpoint. And if you look at the number, the copy number, so this is, uh, again, a segmental duplication that is increasing the copy numbers of this gene. If you look in cattle, cattle have 106 copies of beta defense and where the human genome has 39 and the mouse genome has 52. And you say, well, why is that? You know, why would the cow have so many of these? Well, for all of you uh, animal scientists in the audience, you know that uh, the cow's digestive system is very different from that of a human, the monogastric, both humans and mice are monogastrics. Cows basically have this giant fermentative foregut, right? So you have this big fermentation going on. The cow gets more than 90% of its dietary protein from the microbes that grow on the, the grass and the, the fibrous material that it eats. Okay, so it's the microbes that are providing. A cow is an herbivore, doesn't eat meat. Right? Doesn't eat any, any uh, other animal protein. It's deriving all, almost all of its protein from microbial sources. And when you look at the expression of where beta defensin is expressed in ruminants, it's expressed, all these, all these paralogs that are expressed in, in the rumen. And so they're used there to break down the microbes and make the amino acids then available for um, metabolism. And so this is a high, highly uh, adaptive uh, rearrangement that has occurred in the ruminants. Here's another example with Laura Elnitsky at the NIH where she looked at our evolutionary breakpoints and she looked at the presence of where the bi bidirectional promoters are. Bidirectional promoter is a promoter that actually promotes transcription of gene adjacent genes in, in opposite orientation. And this particular inversion, which occurred on one of the cattle chromosomes, created a bidirectional promoter. So it created a de novo. So it's in a rearrangement that was created de novo if you look at the human annotation here, you have this gene is now going in this direction, this gene is going in that direction, and there's a bidirectional promoter sitting right in here, and on the other side of the inversion created a novel gene, as well as the conserved gene, which you'd also find in the human genome. So you have novel genes and bidirectional promoters and segmental duplications, and all of these things are happening in evolutionary breakpoint regions. Again, highly dynamic regions of the genome involved in adaptive evolutionary change. And so this was the sort of contemporary view, and still is, I would say, the dominant view of evolutionary biologists about what the meaning of chromosome rearrangements is uh, in, a, in an evolutionary and a biological sense. Most evolutionary biologists will tell you, well, chromosome rearrangement is important because it sets up a reproductive isolating system, right? That is, if you get a rearrangement, okay, rearrangement suppresses recombination. Inversion suppresses meiotic recombination in the regions around the inversion. And so it's a mechanism which is really sort of a, uh, it doesn't involve adaptation at all. It just sets up a system by which speciation then could proceed. So either the rearrangements are underdominant, they are going to produce some catastrophic event, like breaking in the middle of a homologous synteny block that's been conserved for a few million, hundred million years and they're eliminated, or they're simply neutral, and they're promote, their rearrangement itself is neutral, but it contributes to speciation through reproductive isolation, recombination, suppression. Well, our view, then, is quite different. Our view is that a very small fraction of these can actually be adaptive and survive, because if they weren't, we wouldn't see the characteristic karyotypes of all the mammalian species that we have. So a small percent, very small fraction of them, would be, exhibit dominance or overdominance and would be adaptive and then be selected for and be a very important process that contributes to the speciation event and not just simply a byproduct of the speciation event, okay? And, um, and this actually is gaining uh, a lot of um, uh, 
experimental data. Uh, there are now many experiments that have been done in yeast where you can grow yeast to high concentrations of alcohol and every time you do that, you get them up to 10%, you can recover the same rearrangements. There's a rearrangement in planaria, small worms, that is a single rearrangement that's associated with the difference between asexual and sexual reproduction uh, in, 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 in those planaria. Absolutely amazing that that's the result of a single uh, uh, translocation. And so this idea actually goes back. It's just that the dominant theorists of evolutionary biology sort of ignored it because they really couldn't, they couldn't provide a population genetic framework that was consistent, really, with the overwhelming observations. And, but if you go back in the literature, it actually dates back to Dobzhansky. And if you don't know that Dobzhansky was at Illinois, at Illinois, I did it again, at Davis, when he, when he coined the phrase, uh, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. And indeed, nothing, I I if you study chromosome evolution, uh, chromosomes make sense except in the light of evolution. And, um, and so there's uh, quite a bit of data for this. Uh, Simpson, George Gaylord Simpson in 44 called this quantum speciation. And I guess what we're, what we're proposing is that, you know, there's this gradualist view of evolution that's a result of simple point mutations and regulatory mutations and change is very gradual. But there's another view of evolution, the mac that macroevolutionary change that's not accounted for by their simple point mutations, okay, or regulatory mutations. There was a view of the macroevolutionists that there were chromosome rearrangements were contributing to big changes, large changes, because just think about it. If you take a translocation, you're taking 10,000 genes from this chromosome and you're moving that chromosome to another chromosome. And you're completely changing the regulations of thousands of genes at the same, at the same, at the same basically in one step. And so if you're going to get big changes, they're going to be really something more than a single, a single, uh, a single point mutation. And so this is, um, this is our view. And uh, you know, we're in the process of doing different kinds of experiments to, to support that. So where do we go from here? Um, well, I'm very interested in the artiodactyl group. Uh, it's a very large group, about 200 uh, different species, with an enormous array of phenotypic adaptations that are really unique among the mammals. If you include the set artiodactyls or the whales, the cetaceans, you also have some of the larger, you do have the largest mammals on Earth. But here, are representatives of most of the families of the artiodactyl. Artiodactyl just means uh, even toed uh, ungulate hoofed mammals. They range from the giraffe to these very tiny little chevrotains, the Bactrian camels, musk deer, hippopotamus, the pronghorn sheep, the pigs and the peccaries. This is a, actually a different order that's related to the pigs. This is the tass a member of the Tassasuda, and so on. These are an amazing group of animals that range, that have everything from altitude adaptations, they can live in the sea, they can live, uh, it, they're, they're found on every continent except Antarctica, and, uh, and exhibit enormous display of unique adaptations. And so we're really interested in this group, and so we're working uh, closely with a consortium which is called Genome 10K. 10K means 10,000. And this is an effort led by Steve O'Brien and uh, Oliver Ryder and, uh, at San Diego Zoo and David Hausler at UCSC and, uh, and myself and a few others. And it's a collaboration uh, with uh, BGI, who's the biggest uh, genome sequencing uh, operation in the world. And together now uh, with BGI, we've sequenced over 100 mammals. And that's a pretty good accomplishment. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this. So what we'd really like to do is look at how chromosome rearrangements affect this diversity in this, uh, this group, which has evolved only over the last uh, uh, 30 or 40 million years, rel relatively a blink in evolutionary time. So again, this doesn't show up here, the arrows. I don't know why. But um, this is where we are. Not all of these species uh, have been sequenced, but uh, the arrows that are supposed to be here indicate the ones that have been, have been sequenced. And, uh, and so we've got uh, more than 12 ruminants from most of the, 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 the major families. And in doing so now, we hope to do the kind of analysis that I just 
shared with you uh, that we did with the human and cattle genome and extend that to these other genomes and uh, to try and understand what has led to the, uh, the adaptations in, within this very, very interesting family. The problem is, the problem is, for those of you who have experience with next generation sequencing, is that the sequences that you get are um, not useful for this purpose. And that's, that's a problem. Why is that the case? Uh, that's the case because when you do shotgun sequencing, you get lots of, of small fragments, right? That's why you sequence to great depth, maybe 30, 40, 50, 60 X. So you have overlap in these very small fragments and you build these contigs. And from the contigs then you use the Rick mate pairs to build the scaffolds, okay? And then the next step, once you have the sequence scaffolds, is you need to have a map. You need to have something that anchors your genome to the chromosomes. Now what happens when you have one of these species, you know, you pick some species off from a phylogenetic distribution of mammals, there's no karyotype and there's no chromosomes. All you have left is a bunch of scaffolds. You cannot, you cannot do the comparative genomics that I just showed you because you do not have the ability to make chromosome maps from thousands of scaffolds that result from a de novo next generation assembly. So that's really a problem for us. So you, if you make a typical, you know, de novo sequence, for us, 100 mammals, they're mostly worthless because we can't, we don't have maps. And maps are very expensive. So it might cost you $10,000 or $5,000 to do a de novo, you know, 60X sequence, but it's going to cost you a million dollars to make a map. Or if you're lucky, you can get long reads and try and do uh, uh, you know, um, an assembly which is going to create uh, much larger scaffolds, which really, which helps, but it doesn't completely solve the problem. And so uh, last year we published a paper. This was work done by a postdoc, my last postdoc at Illinois named uh, Jay Boom Kim, and we published it last year in PIN AS, which is a, a really neat algorithm which gets around the problem of having to make a map. It's a way of using phylogenetic information and mate pair read data to produce chromosome, virtual chromosomes with very high accuracy. And basically the problem, uh, you know, the simple schematic for how this works is first you take your sequence scaffolds and these are, are very standard methods now. You can use LAS-C, you can use Satsuma Synthony from, NIA, from, uh, from the MIT, from Eric Landers' group. And you basically can take the scaffolds, create the synthony blocks, and then RACA is a sort of a post-assembly method. It's a way of taking a primary assembly of scaffolds and then correctly ordering and orienting those scaffolds as they would exist on the de novo sequence genome. And that's just shown here schematically. And the way this works is some very fancy computational science, which is done by J. Boon Kim, who, who's a computational scientist. And what the method uses, the trick, it's not a trick, but the, the approach is to take the scaffolds and to use it to create a posterior probability for adjacency between any two scaffolds in the sequence. So the first step is the alignment. So if you align it to the reference and the two scaffolds align adjacent to a reference genome, then there's certain two scaffolds are adjacent in the de novo sequence genome, but you don't know for sure. But what if you have comparative information? What if you have five species that are closely related to the de novo sequence genome? Then there's certain prior probability, sort of a Bayesian approach, a certain prior probability that those two scaffolds are going to be next to each other in the de novo sequence genome. So the algorithm looks at that, it weights that, and it also adds mate pair data. Mate pair data. Now, if you know something about genome uh, assembly algorithms, not all of the mate pair data is used. Very often there's conflicting data, there's overlapping reads in different parts of the chromosome, and so the algorithms throw that data out because you just can't deal with it. Well, that data is actually highly useful. So if you get the raw read data, you can use that to find mate pair data that was thrown out by the algorithm, but yet would, could possibly support an adjacency. And that's what the algorithm uses. So it uses mate pair data, the raw reads, and phylogenetic data 
and alignment data to compute a probability that two scaffolds are indeed in JSON in the de novo genome. The first genome that we applied this to was a very a fantastic altitude adapted mammal that's found on the uh, plains of, uh, of uh, the Tibetan plain in China. These animals were very highly prized for their, for their fur, for their wool. Um, uh, there was once a million of these uh, on the Tibetan plain, but they were hunted because of their wool. And once you, it's not like sheep, once you shear the wool off these animals, they die. And so they were hunted from a million to down to maybe 75,000 today. So there's very important conservation potential. So BGI uh, uh, sequenced this animal. And for the first time, it applied a new, uh, relatively new technology for building bu larger scaffolds which is why we were very interested in using this to, um, with our RACA algorithm to build these, these new kinds of chromosomes, these uh, virtual chromosomes. So rather than having N50s of less than a million bases, usually 50,000 bases in a typical assembly of a, of a, of a, of a, of a genome, the N50s, this is where 50% of the scaffolds were larger than 2.7 megabases. This is a really good assembly. And that's very important to have these larger scaffolds because if you have larger scaffolds, you have the ability to span evolutionary breakpoints, okay? And you have to be able to span them to confirm them when you do the pairwise comparisons. If you have all these small fragments and they're not big enough to cross one of these breakpoint regions, you can't recover that genomic signal. So this one had a, 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 a 2.7 megabase, and we then reduced uh, about 5,600 scaffolds that were bigger than a kilobase, right, to 60 with this algorithm, which is just twice the haploid number of the species. And if you look at the reconstructed chromosomes, 16 of them corresponded exactly to its closest phylogenetic relative, which was the reference, which was the cattle genome. And the way that looks is, is here. This is a representation, again, of a newer version of Evolution Highway. And I know it's impossible to see, but I'll just show you what the essential features are. So this is a RACA chromosome. This is a reconstructed chromosome, of uh, a group of reconstructed chromosomes from the Tibetan antelope. And this, this far column is the overlay of the scaffolds onto that reconstructed chromosome in comparison with the cattle genome here in the far left lane in the human genome. So I'll call your attention to what RACA does. RACA creates a probability of adjacency between two adjacent scaffolds being truly adjacent using the kind of information that I just told you about. And these little dots are the places are where the scaffolds intersect. So every time you see a dot, it's just the, the region of adjacency between two scaffolds. And as you go to the right, the higher the peak, the higher the probability. And so you can see that how Raqqa does this reconstruction. So this could be just by alignment, but the alignment has a certain uh, probability based on the adjacency scores for, for uh, adjacent scaffolds that are aligned to the reference genome, in this case, the cow. And we can do that for all of the chromosomes. And we showed by simulation that this is a very highly uh, accurate way to do uh, chromosome scale assemblies from de novo uh, next generation sequence data. So that was the first one. Uh, we've done the giraffe because it's an important family. The genome is not published yet, but this is a great genome. Obviously some fantastic adaptations in giraffe and its cardiovascular system, in its anatomical system. It's just one of the most fascinating and beautiful animals on the planet, and I'm glad we sequenced it. Uh, and uh, this one had a fantastic assembly, the largest that we'd worked to to date, almost three megabases, okay? And uh, here you could reduce the number of scaffolds, in this case greater than 2,000 base pairs or one uh, relative to the Tibetan antelope. We used one kilobase here. They had about 3,800 scaffolds. Uh, uh, now you can see reduced to 53, which is great. Now giraffe had a karyotype. Right? But again, Dobzhansky, nothing in evolution uh, makes sense, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Before, we just had chromosomes and pictures and numbers. We can never relate them 
to one another. And now, with the kind of approaches here as reconstructed giraffe chromosomes, we can relate it to the cow chromosomes and to, uh, to human chromosomes and to any other species that has a, refer uh, a sequence genome. And so that allows us to do the kind of analysis that I talked to you about to go in and say, well, let's look at these breakpoint regions, let's look in the conserved blocks, and let's see if we can get some ideas about some of the unique adaptations that have occurred in this particular lineage. So this is the last part of the talk, um, and um, I think this is really exciting uh, work now that, uh, that, that we're doing. Again, Jay Boom Kim and Dennis Larkin, a former postdoc now at the Royal Col uh, Veterinary College in London, have been involved in this. This is the first attempt that we uh, used uh, with Pavel Pevsner's group back in 2005 using an algorithm called the Minimal Genome Rearrangement, MGR algorithm, to reconstruct ancestral genomes from the genome maps and sequences of extant species. And so there are several algorithms now for doing this, but what it allows you to do is say if you have the two or any pairs of existing genomes, you can determine what the most likely chromosome organization was in its ancestral genome by looking at various uh, properties uh, and synteny relationships of the genomes as they compare to other genomes. So here is the ancestor uh, of, of, of the rodents, here would be the ancestor of the carnivores, here would be the ancestor of the artiodactyls, here is the ancestor the, of um, the lower, um, of, uh, this is the ferungulate ancestor of cattle, all these species, cattle, pigs, and, and humans, and then all the way back here to the boreo eutherian ancestor. Okay, this is the ancestor of all of these uh, phylogenetic groups. Now, this was the first attempt at doing this in 2005. It looks really good. We determined that the most likely number of autosomes was 24. That was very cool. But if you overlaid these fragments onto the human genome, you'd find that the coverage, the amount of information that was captured in this reconstructed Boreo-Eutherian genome was only 50 percent. That's because we just didn't have enough information there. We didn't have enough information to, to, to um, have the maps uh, created at high enough resolution or to have the reconstructed ancestor from the holes really in the, in, in the maps because much of this information was done with mapping information and not sequence information. So this is the, the work that we're doing now. It's unpublished data. Um, and we've now got 20 species from 11 of the 23 orders and seven of them are scaffold assemblies. And now we have done the first reconstructions back to the Eutherian. This is the ancestor of all placental mammals. This is really the first sequence-based reconstruction for all placental mammals. And we've redone the Boreo Eutherian now at very high resolution. The next ancestor, Euarchonoglyer, and then the ancestor of all of the primates, which is the that we've done, which is the simian ancestor. This Eutherian ancestor goes back about a uh, hundred million years or so, then you've got about seven million years here, and then another seven or eight million years, and then you get down here to about uh, 40 or 50 million years, and uh, so all of this has happened in a, in a relatively short period of time. But um, what we're really interested in then from the reconstructions is now that we could look at the breakpoints, the rearrangements, these are the numbers of rearrangements as you go along the lineages. Now we can look and see what some of these rearrangements were between these major, major ancestral groups that are defining very important adaptations that uh, exist in the extant members of these ancestors. And uh, we hope that's going to tell us a lot about um, phenotypic evolution in mammals. And here's an example of just a single uh, or two of those chromosomes and the kinds of information that are present, uh, how rich these data really are. This is the Eutherian, reconstructed Eutherian ancestor, one of its chromosomes, and overlaid, here are three of the descendant genomes, the Borio Eutherian, the Uarconoglyer genome, and the Simian ancestor, and then, you know, some of these 20 or so uh, uh, species. And it's, I know it's impossible to see the details, but the general patterns are easily seen here. You can see there's no rearrangements in the ancestor, this is the Eutherian, and then three descendant species. If you look, <coughs> excuse me, at the, uh, 
primate groups, you see very highly conserved between the ancestral configuration and all of the primate genomes. But you see large numbers of rearrangements in the other groups. Here's the opposite example. Here's the ancestrals overlaid on a different chromosome, Eutheria 19, where there's very high degree of conservation with the artiodactyls and the carnivores and the rodents, but a lot of rearrangements in the primate lineage. So these data are really rich. It's the first time we were able to do these kinds of comparison at this resolution. And of course, there's lots of statistics that one can derive from this. You can determine the number of ancestral chromosome fragments. You can look at the coverage now. We have very high coverage relative to the human genome. And of course, you can look and then um, you can determine the operations from each ancestor to its descendant ancestor. And you can look at the number of fusions, fissions, transpositions, and inversions. And of course, then go in to these regions and look at the gene content and see what the gene content tells you about the rearrangements that have occurred along those lineages and their possible relationships to phenotypic traits. And I just want to put this up here because Quan Lu's here and to tell you that we're on a, an exciting new path of data visualization. Quan Lu Ma is here from UC Davis, and he and his students have been collaborating. I brought them this problem because it's such a fascinating problem uh, to, to work on and to try and communicate to the general public of how this happens. All of what you're seeing is sort of very static, right? Evolution is very dynamic. And so we brought this problem to Kwan Lu. We said, how can we visualize this in a dynamic way, these rearrangements and breakages over time? Now, this is a screenshot, so I can't animate this. But I can tell you the work that they're doing is sort of a dream uh, for me to see this. Here, they're arranged according to the ancestors I just showed you. He's taking the data set that we work on, the Eutherian ancestor, Boreal Eutherian, Euroconogly, Simian Homo sapiens. And that's the student that's working on the project. He's the Homo sapiens. And, um, and all of these colors represent different ancestral fragments, chromosome fragments. And actually, when you put the button or you mouse over or you click, you can visualize the evolutionary history in a dynamic way of any chromosome fragment to its descendant species. You can see the translocation. The chromosomes break, they rearrange, and they form in the next species. And the framework that they're building will be able to fill in the entire phylogenetic framework. And as the as the assemblies become available, we're going to be able to load those in, and you're going to be able to visualize all the changes that have occurred across any evolutionary time span. It's going to be fantastic. And what we hope to do, Quan Lu, is have this as an exhibit on chromosome evolution in the Exploratorium in the next year. It's very intuitive. You actually, it's touch screen. You can walk and touch the chromosomes, and they evolve before your very eyes. And of course, we have these fictitious animals here uh, at each of these, uh, you know, points except for the extant. He's not factitious. He really lives. And, uh, and, and so it's going to be a very powerful evolution, uh, tool to demonstrate some very fundamental principles of evolution. I'm very happy to be able to share that with you. Next time you'll be able to touch the chromosomes yourself when Kwan Lu comes with the program. So uh, last slide. Um, you know, it says, for those of you who can't see it back there, hello, we're, in, we're here as Darwin's witnesses. Um, I don't know if you have uh, Jehovah's Witnesses here, in, in, uh, but they come on the door and they knock on the door and they say, you know, we're Jehovah's Witness. We have five minutes. Can we have five minutes of your time to share with you the good news about evolution, which they never say. But the good news about evolution is that we have such enormous power from DNA sequencing and our bioinformatics tools and visualization tools that we're truly at the dawn of a new age of evolution as a science. Okay, not just an observational thing, not just to build phylogenetic trees of animals, not just to talk, look, and you know, hypothesize about adaptation, but to really understand the molecular genetic basis of how these changes have occurred through evolutionary time. And these chromosome maps, comparative chromosome maps, finally provide an evolutionary framework to do so. So I just want to thank um, the people who have actually done the work over the years. Um, particularly Dennis Larkin, who was with me for nine years at the University of Illinois. He's now a faculty member at the Royal Veterinary College of London, and his postdoc, Marta Ferre. Uh, Gian Ma at the Institute of Gen for Genomic Biology at the University of Illinois. He's a faculty member, um, a computational scientist. 
Um, the guys at BGI have done the sequencing, Guo Zhang, Ching Lei Kai, and Xiao Dang Fang, a tremendous bioinformatics group. Uh, Jay Boom Kim, who was really the computational scientist who did the Raqqa algorithm and adapted the Raqqa algorithm for the reconstruction. So the reconstructions, the ancestral reconstructions that I showed you were done now with a, 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 um, a modified version of the Raqqa algorithm for ancestral reconstructions. Uh, Loretta Alville, Boris Capitano, and Mike Welge at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois, who helped us create the, the Evolution Highway comparative gen um, chromosome browser, and our friends, uh, my friend Steve O'Brien and Ali Ryder, and those with the Genome 10K Consortium, who are really creating the, the, the voucher specimens. It's really hard to get giraffe DNA or Indian munchak or musk deer or some of these mammals that exist in far flung places of the earth. And they're assembling these through Ollie's at the San Diego Zoo, so they have enormous collections. He has the frozen zoo and is now making these DNA collections available for DNA sequencing. So uh, Ollie's playing a very important role. And I thank all of you for uh, listening to me for an hour. Thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Harris, for the very exciting Thanks. lecture. Uh, I think we have time for some questions. Help me out. Come on. Yeah, somebody has one. So it was so clear. What is your view on the origin of cancer? Good question. So um, I think that one of the missed, hallmark missed features, yeah. if you look at, 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 a, at, a, at an end stage tumor, they're all rearranged. They're chromosomes. You have aneuploidies. You have increased numbers. You have rearrangements. You have huge deletions, inversions. Mm. And the genomes are all messed up. And so the question is, what's destabilizing the cell in the first place? And in some cases, like the acute lymphocytic, some of the lymphomas and leukemias, it's been documented for more than 30 years that a single rearrangement can produce yeah. leukemia. And so, you know, I think it's been missed because it's very hard to do rearrangements. People are doing sequencing and aligning sequencing to look for SNPs and then looking for tumor, you know, mutations in tumor suppressor genes and P53 and all that, but nobody's looking for rearrangements because it's hard to do. Yeah. Because you have to do a de novo assembly on every, to do it right, you have to do a de novo assembly. You just can't do alignments to catch inversions and trans translocations. Mm -hmm. And so what is the primary genetic lesion? Okay, in some cases you have some destabilization. If you have a mutation that affects the segregation of chromosomes, in mitosis, you're going to have the possibility of rearrangement. That's why they're so deranged, because eventually you accumulate mutations in, uh, in genes that are involved in cell, in the normal uh, cell division, normal mitotic process. So I think that the rearrangements will be a very characteristic feature. If you can sort through and get back to the primary tumors, okay, you don't look at the end stage because yeah. by then it's a yeah. mess. But if you can get to the primary tumors and do de novo assemblies and not just alignment, but actually do the map and compare mm. those, the signal for those primary lesions will come through. Mm. So that's what we're going to be doing in the next few years, I hope, okay. at Davis, is to be looking more closely at uh, early rearrangements in the first steps mm. of transformation. So what is the cause of the rearrangement? Did so the, the rearrangements probably so occur. Some of those are chance, but I think there are some point mutations okay. that affect the segregation of, pro mm. of the chromosomes in meiosis. Sometimes uh, in certain cells, you also have, you switch on the expression of trans retrotransposons, and those destabilize the cells during meiosis, so the arms of the chromosomes become <laughs> mm. yeah. susceptible. So it's, uh, there are many things, a retrotransposon activation, point mutation, but a rearrangement is a really serious lesion in a cell because it can change the regulation of thousands of genes with a single mutation. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're grossly uh, understudied because it's hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. Any uh, other questions? Yeah. So uh, there are 
very interesting sort of conservation for the breakpoints. I wonder whether you can correlate those uh, breakpoints with the structural feature. For example, the high C map now available. Yeah, great question. So Dennis is, is trying to do that because for the rearrangements to take, we, we know this representation of chromosomes, of metaphase chromosomes lined up, is not the way they exist in the nucleus of the cell, right? And so for these rearrangements to take place, parts of the chromosomes actually have to talk, be in close contact, contact with each other in order for them to rearrange. And so methods like high c where you can bring down the chromosomes in, a, in an interphase nucleus and then study adjacencies of fragments is a very important step in understanding the mechanisms of how, uh, of how these rearrangements occur. And there are people who are trying to do that now. But I have no doubt that um, the three-dimensional organization of the chromosomes in the nucleus is a, plays a critical role in finding these recurrent rearrangements. Why are there recurrent rearrangements? Uh, it's the two things. One is the, the templating, because you have repeat sequences that may line up, and the other is that they have to physically be, get close to another in order to have a double strand breakage and a recombination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Any other questions? So if not, let's uh, thank Harris again. Thanks. Yeah, thank you Thanks so much. Thanks. 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 Thanks.